Good evening. I'm Jacqueline Apser, the Executive Director of Domestic Violence Services Network, or DVSN, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third presentation of our inaugural speaker series with Assistant District Attorney and Senior Trial Counsel, Suzanne Kantz Wiseman, who will take us behind the mystique of our Massachusetts court system. Pre-COVID, each year, we held a special appreciation breakfast to thank everyone who supports our mission with their time, talent, or treasure. Our community colleagues, our first responder partners, our donors and funders, and most definitely our volunteer advocates. Our gift to them, in addition to a scrumptious breakfast, was an opportunity to learn more about the complex and insidious nature of domestic violence. Given the restrictions of the COVID crisis and the need to put the breakfast to bed for the time being, we decided to continue with the educational component and offer it as an opportunity for anyone who might be interested. We have had strong participation for each of the presentations with positive feedback from many, so that even as the COVID crisis recedes and our special breakfast resumes, we may continue these online presentations. As with earlier presentations, we are recording tonight's event, which will be emailed to everyone who registered for this program. It will also be posted on our website along with the first two. Following tonight's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. We invite you and welcome you to type your questions into the question and answer box to be addressed at the close of Suzanne's talk. At our first presentation in January, we looked at the many barriers that keep victims locked in an abusive situation. During COVID, these basic needs exploded, including food, housing, and income insecurities, along with schools in disarray, all leading to increased safety and mental health challenges for our clients and their children. At our presentation in March, we took a much closer look at the impact on children who live in these situations, witnessing the humiliation, degradation, verbal abuse, and the physical abuse of a primary caretaker, and how small gestures on our part for children we suspect are living in these conditions can help mitigate that damage. Tonight, we journey through the Massachusetts court system to better understand how convoluted, confusing, and intimidating it can be for a victim of domestic abuse who may find themselves involved with the courts through a civil case for a restraining order, a criminal case of assault or worse, or a family court case involving divorce and or custody of children. Suzanne Kantz Weissman is an assistant district attorney and a senior trial counsel for the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. Suzanne has been a prosecutor in Middlesex County for 23 years. And in addition to being the senior trial counsel, she is also chief of the development team, a training bureau within the DA's office. She trains police, judges, and various constituencies within the law enforcement world at the local, state, and federal levels on high-risk domestic violence and cyber investigations. Suzanne was previously the chief of the domestic violence program and currently primarily prosecutes cases involving sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, and homicide. Suzanne is dedicated to obtaining justice for all involved through highly competent, measured, and thoughtful litigation. Suzanne was named the 2018 recipient of the Middlesex County Assistant District Attorney Award by the Middlesex County Bar Association for her hard work and determination that has made a positive impact on the Commonwealth. I am delighted to welcome Suzanne as she helps us understand a dry, complex, and mysterious subject with a bit more clarity and comprehension. So welcome Suzanne and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna to attempt to be dry, complex, and somewhat mysterious during this presentation, I promise. <laughs> So my presentation is about the court system and I did create a PowerPoint. I do work much better with questions and I would absolutely encourage people to ask questions. I promise I will talk faster, not go longer. So don't think that it'll make it go longer. So please um, just consider asking questions during it because I really want to tailor this for what you may all wonder about what's going on in the court system in Massachusetts. So I saw that some people um, had already typed in some questions, so I will try to um, articulate answers to those questions as I'm going through my presentation, and if people want to continue asking questions, that is great. Here is um, what we're going to talk about. I've broken it down into four different topics. The first is the courts. The second is the crimes. Then we get to a court case um, anatomy, and then the last section, I briefly talk about restraining orders and harassment prevention orders. So in terms of the courts, 
there's basically two different forms of courts. There's going to be what's called trial courts, and then there's going to be what's called appellate courts. Trial courts are courts that where someone is being charged or accused or uh, uh, attempted to be a trial where there's going to be evidence and there's going to be either a judge or a jury who's going to have to find that evidence and given the facts, what is the law and what should the outcome be? So the trial court is basically something is happening to a person that involves evidence, it involves testimony, it involves facts, it involves law, and it involves decisions. Then there's the other types of courts, which are called the appellate courts. And the appellate courts aren't so much trials. They're more of a review of the lower courts to try to determine was the law applied correctly? And if it was, then it can be upheld. And if it wasn't, then it could be reversed and what's called remanded to go back to the trial courts to have a do-over. Generally, they're not finding facts. They're pretty much the facts are determined at the trial court level. So it's not like new evidence is presented at an appellate court level that could change a factual outcome. It's more of a, did the lawyers do things right? Did the judges do things right? Did the evidence come in right? And was the law applied correctly in the case? Appellate courts do come out with new laws, which then may govern trials that happen at later dates. So we have the courts that decide the facts, and then we have the courts that decide were, was the law correctly applied to those facts. Those are the two kind of different breakdowns of the courts. And within, I mean, obviously I threw up a couple of graphics. I mean, a lot of people obviously hear about the Whitey Bulger case and a lot of people hear about the Supreme Court. Those are kind of the two things that you should be thinking about. In a trial court, a person is charged with something or accused of something or has to answer for something. And in an appellate court, it's more a series of judges that are deciding if what happened at the trial court happened correctly. And just in terms of there's a tons of examples at both the, the state level as well as the federal level of what different trial courts are. There's obviously, you know, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts alone, there's the district court, the superior court, the probate and family court, the juvenile court, the housing court, the land court. And that's not even including all of the federal courts that are housed in Massachusetts, like the First Circuit Court and all that type of thing. Then there's also all of the different types of and levels of appeals. And I'm gonna go through a little bit at the end of this about the different appellate levels that there are, but I just wanted to kind of create the scenario or at least the picture in your head that there's a myriad of different court systems. And when people are involved in domestic violence cases, they end up having to touch or be involved with a lot of these different court systems. And I can give you just an example. Say there is a, uh, a spouse, you know, two spouses. We'll, we'll, for this purpose, we're going to say a husband and a wife, and they have children, and they're in the process of going through a divorce. So that's going to involve the probate and family court. There may or may not be child care issues, which would also be involved in the probate and family court. Their children may or may not be involved with the criminal justice system. Say that kids aren't going to school or there's some other action where someone needs to act on behalf of the kids, that would involve the juvenile court. Then if there's any sort of restraining order action that's been taken, that can be involved in the district court or in the probate court. And God forbid there's a criminal action that's also involved that something violent happened during the course of that divorce. And then that victim and that defendant will also be dealing with either the district court or the superior court, depending on the charge. So in any one relationship or scenario, there could be anywhere from two, three, four, or five courts that someone is involved in, in having to navigate in terms of, do I go to this court for this action? Or do I have to go, like, why can't we talk to our divorce attorney about what's going on in the criminal case? And all of the courts are separate and none of the courts have um, interaction with each other in terms of communication with each other. So it's a very, very difficult system to navigate and it becomes very overwhelming, especially when the parties are dealing with more than one court at the same time. So trying to get a system in place that makes it from, from my perspective, I deal with the criminal court. So I deal with the district court and the superior court of the criminal nature. So trying to come up and our jobs at the district attorney's office is to help victims navigate the criminal justice system and the criminal courts, 
because that's the role that we have. And we try to take at least that one small part of the court system and make it more easily accessible to them by helping them navigate through it. But a victim or a defendant would have all of these other different courts to deal with depending on the situation that they're going on and depending on the parties and what courts they're in. There's also then going to be, in addition to the different types of courts, there's different actions that can happen in those courts. So I am going to talk primarily in, for this section about trial courts. So we're talking about the trial courts. So in the trial courts, there can be civil cases and there can be criminal cases. The main difference between a civil case and a criminal case are the parties. In a civil case, it's going to be a plaintiff versus a defendant, meaning someone is suing someone else. In a criminal case, the parties are the state, or in our case, it's called the Commonwealth, versus a particular defendant. So it's not a person suing another person. It is the state of Massachusetts enforcing a criminal law against a defendant. So the goal of a criminal case is different than a civil case as well. The goal of a civil case is to resolve controversy between parties, meaning someone thinks that someone else or some other entity has wronged them. And therefore a civil suit is brought to right that wrong, which generally is money damages. It, an example that I put in here is a slip and fall where, you know, someone is outside a Dunkin' Donuts say, and the, the owner of that particular Dunkin' Donuts didn't salt in the winter. And the, the person who's going in to buy their, you know, their coffee fell on the ice because it wasn't salted. And they may sue the Dunkin' Donuts and say, you should have salted, you had an unsafe um, situation, I'm gonna sue Dunkin' Donuts. Um, it could also be a contract where um, I recently just had worked on on my house and say our contractor decided not to show up. I could sue the contractor for the money that I gave him if he failed to show up. Um, a divorce, that's another one where it's one person versus another person, they're suing to get a divorce. And then restraining orders also are considered to be civil proceedings where one person is suing for a restraining order against another person. Whereas criminal cases, like I said, are the state, or in this case, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts against defendant. And it is addressing the, the wrong as a whole to the community, meaning a criminal law was broken. And the results are not money, although it could be a fine, um, but it also could be probation, incarceration. It tends to be a dual, I guess, end result of a remedial measure as well as a um, attempt to, to fix the wrong. So that could involve a fine. So say someone drove with a suspended license or something like that, and they may end up getting a $500 fine, something like that, to kind of keep them from driving with a suspended license. Or if someone hits someone or robs someone or sells drugs or something like that, they could be put on probation or they could be sent to jail to try to, to, to make the Commonwealth whole because that person had broken a law in, this, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The main thing that I wanna emphasize is that the victim is not a party. It's the state versus a defendant because the state is meaning someone from my office or another district attorney's office is tasked with enforcing the laws of the Commonwealth. The victims aren't tasked with enforcing the laws of the Commonwealth. So the next set of slides, I try to go through each of the different players that happen and that are in the courthouse. And I wish that I could do this uh, with the way that I actually do it with victims. When I sit down and I talk to victims about trials, and I, I, I actually tried to think of an interactive way to do that on this, but I couldn't figure it out. But I actually take a notepad and I sketch out the courtroom and I put little boxes and stick figures and I'm like, this guy does this. And I kind of try to give little anecdotal stories about the people that I think are going to be in there to try to help make the person a little bit more comfortable so that when they walk in the courtroom and they're like, oh, that's the guy with the handlebar mustache that I was told about. Like I try to, you know, talk to them to try to make them feel a little bit more comfortable about going in there. But it's very helpful to see a courtroom because a courtroom can be so overwhelming, especially some, you know, some of the courthouses are these old, you know, the, 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 the Superior Court in Lowell, 
up it until recently has been this courthouse that Daniel Webster practiced in. It's this beautiful old crumbling down courthouse, but it's it's majestic when you walk into it. It's not safe right now, but it's majestic when you walk into it and it's beautiful, but it's incredibly intimidating. The ceilings are probably 25 feet high. There's all sorts of pictures from literally the 1800s. It's huge. It feels like they have to walk a mile to get to the seat that they're going to be sitting in. And they literally have to walk around the entire courtroom to get to the seat that they're going to be in. So, and then conversely, now a lot of these newer courtrooms are so high tech and beautiful, and but also equally in a different way, but equally intimidating because they're walking into this brand new high tech, uh, courtroom with all these TVs and monitors and, and stations, and it's, it is very intimidating. So I try to break it down and I try to kind of explain everyone that's in the courtroom so that when people are in there, people can feel much more comfortable in the courtroom. Obviously, the most important person um, in the courtroom, at least arguably the most important person in the courtroom, is the judge. And that judge is neutral. The judge is there to determine the law and whether or not the law is applied correctly. There are cases, which we'll talk about, where cases, where cases, actual cases can be tried by a judge, in which case it's their decision to try the case. But for the most part, the judge is there to make sure that justice prevails and that the law is provide the law is applied equally to both sides and in accordance with all the statutes of the Commonwealth. In addition to a judge, there is a series of people called clerks. There is a head clerk called a clerk magistrate. And then there are assistant clerks um, in addition or below the clerk magistrate. So the clerks are, some of the clerks, especially the clerk magistrate, uh, can actually act as, and I don't mean this disparagingly at all, but almost like mini judges. Like they can hear hearings and show cause hearings and small claims, and they get the ability to make decisions that a lot of people would have thought that a judge would have to make, but a clerk magistrate is allowed to make those decisions. Um, for example, in a criminal case, a clerk magistrate is allowed to set bail. A lot of people think a judge sets bail all the time, but a clerk magistrate is allowed to set bail, um, depending on the court and the case and that type of thing. But so the clerk magistrate, the head clerk, gets to do a lot of judge judicial-like functions within the courthouse. Then there's also a number of other clerks that, that are in the courthouse that can do um, run the courtroom, call the cases, make sure that nowadays, we used to have what's called a stenographer, where, well, back in the old days when I first started, we used to have the person that sits there and types. Then we ended up with the person who sits there and talks and, and everything comes out transcribed. Now everything is actually just taped on this FTR recording. And so the clerk's job is to make sure that the recording is on, that all the microphones can be heard, that everything is getting picked up and that the courtroom is running in an efficient fashion, that the right cases are getting called, that the right lawyers are assigned to the right defendants and the, all that kind of thing. So the, the clerks are basically running the courtrooms for the judges. Then in, there's also clerks that then also work down in the office who aren't in the courthouse. And those are gonna be the clerks who take, if you need to file something, they're gonna be the, the, the people that you give it to. If they're gonna be the ones, for example, if somebody wanted to go in and get a restraining order, they go to the restraining order desk of that clerk's office. There's going to be a clerk down in that office. That clerk is going to take the paperwork, check it, make sure it's correct. That clerk then gets it to the clerk who's in the courtroom. And then the clerk in the courtroom then gets that restraining order in front of a judge. That's kind of how that process works. Um, in PCF, which is probate and family court, there's also what's called an as assistant judicial case manager. This is very similar to a clerk magistrate. They get some judicial type duties um, in terms of filings and fee waivers and that kind of thing. So they just have some additional um, powers, but they're very equivalent to like a clerk magistrate. So we have the judges, we have the clerks. I would say the next category of people that are in the courtroom are the lawyers. And the lawyers represent either side. So in a civil case, there's civil lawyers that represent each civil side of that case. They rep represent the plaintiff, which is a civil plaintiff, and they represent the defendant, which in a civil case is a civil defendant. In a criminal case, the lawyers consist of 
the Commonwealth, which is myself or another member of my office or any other DA's office, we are the only people that can represent the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, well, there could also be attorney generals and that type of thing, but it has to be a member, a, a, pros a prosecutor. And some people are like, well, I would like to be my own prosecutor. I would like to be the one that gets to prosecute the case. And it doesn't work like that. It has to be an actual prosecutor that acts on behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So those are the lawyers on that side. On the other side, which is the criminal defense side, there are different kinds of lawyers. There are private attorneys. So someone could just look in, I don't even know if they have white pages anymore, but if they did, they could look in the white pages or the yellow pages and they could look under defense attorneys and they could hire a defense attorney. There's also what's called public defenders. And so that is the Committee for Public Counsel Services in Middlesex County uh, or in the state of Massachusetts, actually, they have it in the whole state. And those are public defense attorneys paid for by the Commonwealth that represent indigent or clients that cannot pay. There's certain criteria that gets them involved. Um, and they're basically my counterpart for the defense side. So, and then the third category of people are private attorneys who take on what's called bar advocate work, which means that it's a, say my name is John Smith and I'm an attorney in say the town of Tewksbury and I offer my services to Lowell District Court and I go into Lowell District Court and say, hey, I will take on public clients if you need me to. And there's a whole, a bunch of rules that they have to follow. And there's, there's a ton of stuff that they have to do to be able to do this, but they can get public clients as a private attorney. And I know that's a little confusing, but basically there's three different types of defense attorneys. There's ones that are the same as the DA, but on the other side, there's ones that are completely private. And then there's ones that are private that volunteer to be public attorneys. So those are the lawyers that are involved in it. And then in addition to the lawyers, there's also probation officers. So probation officers are officers that have two jobs. The first job that they do is they monitor defendants while they're on some sort of pretrial release. So I'm gonna give you the basic example. A defendant gets arrested for drunk driving. The defendant is released on bail. So while the case is pending, he is out in the community, but he is, he maybe had to pay a certain dollar amount of bail and he's not allowed to drink and he's not allowed to drive. And he has to say, do random screens so that they can make sure that he's not drinking. The probation officer is gonna be the one that's monitoring him to make sure that he's not drinking while he's out on his bail. The second thing that a probation officer does is they monitor defendants after they have been convicted and put on probation. So there's pre-trial probationary conditions that they monitor, and then there's post-conviction probation that they monitor, where someone is convicted of a crime, either they go to jail or they don't go to jail, but they're given a period of probation with a number of conditions. So for example, they're given the condition of they can't, they have to stay away and have no contact with the victim in their case, and maybe they're put on a bracelet. The probation department will be the ones that are monitoring that to make sure that that probation, probationer, the defendant, isn't violating that condition and contacting the victim. So the probation officers have a very important role, both while a case is pending and after a case is over, if a defendant is on probation. Then there is also something called a guardian ad litem. And I put this in here because sometimes people hear this phrase and it sounds like an odd phrase and people don't necessarily know what it means. So what it means is it is someone that is appointed by a court to represent someone else's interest that can't represent themselves. What this tends to mean is a child, an elderly person who is unable to care for themselves, or someone who has enough mental difficulties that they can't take care of themselves. For the most part, it tends to mean children. So to give you my example before of a husband and a wife who have children and they're going through a divorce and maybe the child has some issues and they're involved with all these different court systems, if, if the court finds the child needs an advocate to speak on their behalf. So say 
mom is accusing dad of something, dad is accusing mom of something, and the court wants someone to speak on behalf of the actual child, they'll appoint what's called a guardian ad litem, which means someone who now represents that child. And just like any other lawyer, their role is to zealously represent their client, which in that case is that child. And they have to talk to the child, but they also have to act on that child's behalf. So they make recommendations of, I don't think the child should go with mom, or I don't think that I, child should go with dad, or quite frankly, I don't think child should go with either of them. Or I think child should get to see both of them, or they make recommendations on behalf of the child for the child because the child isn't old enough to speak for themselves. Um, there's a lot of training that's uh, involved in it. They tend to be a lawyer. Sometimes they're a mental health professional. Um, it's a very uh, regulated industry. It's not just, just anyone can't be appointed a guardian ad litem. People don't get to bring their own guardian ad litems in. It's something that the court appoints for someone who needs representation. Um, the Another party that's in the court are advocates. And there's tons of different kinds of advocates. There's obviously advocates that work with my office. So the advocates that work with my office aren't uh, representatives of a victim, meaning they're not employed or affiliated with a victim. They're employed and affiliated with my office. And their role is to make sure that that victim knows their rights and that victim knows everything that's going on in court. We're gonna talk a little bit later about a victim's rights in a case and their job is to ensure that those victim's rights are adhered to along with the prosecutor. Um, so there is no, um, for example, the main thing that we tell people is there's no confidentiality between the advocates that work for the DA's office and victims because they're employees of the DA's office. So if someone says something to an advocate that works for our office and it's something that we would normally have to turn over to a defendant or a defendant's attorney, we would have to turn it over. We don't get to be confidential because we're employees of the state. We're not employees of that victim. As opposed to some lay advocates that don't work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they work for victim service agencies or they work for mental health agencies or that other type of lay advocates, they're able to sometimes have a privilege and get, and the victim can tell them things that they aren't allowed because of statutes to share with other people. So the key is to figure out if the advocate that someone is dealing with, are they who are they employed by? Are they employed by the police station or the DA's office? Or are they employed by an agency or have, for example, are they a licensed social worker? Something like that, that would give them a privilege that would require them that they were not allowed to divulge anything that was confidential. The next group that's in the courtroom is court officers and security. And this is the um, this is the people, and I did put in here that uh, I think there's white shirts and blue shirts, and that line has been a little bit blurred right now because I think everyone's wearing white shirts now. So we don't really have the white shirts and the blue shirts anymore. We have all white shirts. And there's two different kinds of security, and a lot of time that's also is overlapped, but there's security when you go into a courthouse, so it's the person that does the metal detector and the screening and checks your ID and nowadays checks your temperature and asks you all the COVID questions. That's what their role is. Um, but then there's also court officers that are in the courtroom that allows a measure of security in the courtroom to make sure that no one acts up, that no one tries to attack anyone else, that there's decorum in there, they won't let people talk on their phones in the courtroom. They won't let people wear hats in the courtroom. They won't let people talk in the courtroom. So, I mean, obviously they're there for security in case someone does something terrible, but they're also there to, to, to demonstrate the seriousness of a court proceeding so that people can't be sitting there chewing gum and talking on their phone and laughing and that kind of thing. Um, so that's what the court officers do. They're not police officers. They are court officers. It's a separate entity and they work for the court. Another category of people that's in there are interpreters. And these are people that come in for either victims, witnesses, or defendants who need help uh, understanding the language that they speak. Um, and they can sit at council table with a defendant. They can sit next to the witness box with a witness. They, they use, sometimes some are very high tech and they have little earpieces. Sometimes more so now people are being much more high tech and a lot of them are even wireless now and they can talk into each other's ears so that they're not even 
talking out loud in the courtroom. They're actually talking very quietly and it, and it translates into an earpiece that um, the person that needs the interpreter has. Um, they are not allowed to, they have to, in order to be an interpreter, it has to be a court certified interpreter, which means it needs to be someone that the court has authorized. So for example, a victim can't bring their brother or their mother or their child and be like, can this person interpret for me in court? That's not allowed. It has to be a court certified interpreter. And the reason for that is we have to make sure that the interpretation is correct, accurate, and non-biased. It can't be like where someone is paraphrasing what someone says or someone is, is um, extrapolating what someone says. It literally has to be word for word what someone says, what gets interpreted in a court system. And then, oops, the final two parties are obviously the defendant and then the plaintiff or the commonwealth. Defendant is generally a person. Um, it's called the defendant in both the criminal and civil cases. Um, it's the person that's being charged or sued. And it's, it, in other words, it's the person who's going to face the consequences. It can be a company. In civil cases, it's often a company. For example, it could be Dunkin' Donuts kind of thing. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a specific person. It's very rare that we charge companies or entities in a criminal um, realm. We have, there has to be um, a, a certain criminal negligence that is alleged in order to charge a company in a criminal world. So most of the time when you see a criminal case, it's going to be a particular defendant, um, one person that's doing something. The last side is obviously the Commonwealth of Plaintiff. So in other words, in this case, not me. Um, it is not the victim. Um, it is me who's charging a defendant with a crime. In a civil case, it's going to be the plaintiff or the party or the organization who's suing the other party for the damages or to stop them. An example would be um, to, to in what's called an injunction. I'm trying to stop you from doing something. Um, we might have just seen some of this going on in the papers about what's going on with the Boston police. So those are it, that's a suit. It's a civil suit to stop someone from doing something or to do something to someone. Um, so those are all of the parties that are in the courtroom. So you can understand why when victims and witnesses come into the criminal justice world, they're overwhelmed because there's a lot of different people that they may need to come into contact with. And it's incredibly hard for them to sort out who are these people? What am I supposed to do with them? Who am I supposed to talk to? Who am I supposed to listen to? Who's confidential? Who's not? So it's an incredibly overwhelming system for people. Each side has rights. Um, and the, I'm going to talk now exclusively about criminal cases, because um, that's what I'm most familiar with, but each side has rights. So in the criminal world, the defendant has a number of rights. Um, obviously, there's, you've heard about, you know, motions to suppress and the law of search, anyone who's watched Law and Order or Chicago PD or any of the shows that are out there, there's a ton of things out there about they have the rights against search, against seizure, against arrest, against interrogation. There's all sorts of those things that are out there. They have a right to an attorney. They have a right to get to be granted bail. They don't, they have the right not to testify. They get to choose if a case is going to be a plea, if they're going to plead guilty or if they're gonna take the case to trial. That's not up to me. If they're gonna plead guilty or take a case to trial, it's up to the defendant. They get to choose if it's going to be a bench, meaning it's going to be a trial in front of a judge or a trial in front of a jury. I don't get any say in that. In a criminal case, a defendant gets to decide, I want to be tried by a judge or I want to be tried by a jury, and I don't get to object, agree, or they don't actually care what I think. Um, they get the right to present evidence. They get a right to limit my evidence. Um, and there's a ton of case law that's out there that pertains to the the whole litany of defendants' rights that are out there. And it's incumbent upon the come of me to know all of those rights so that I'm navigating a system by not infringing on any of the defendant's rights. The Commonwealth has some rights. Um, some of our rights um, are dictated by discretion, meaning it's ultimately up to the Commonwealth to choose what a particular defendant is charged with. It's up to the Commonwealth to choose what court it goes in, meaning is it going to be charged in district court or is it going to be charged in superior court? There is also a significant amount of case law that pertains to when, what, and how the Commonwealth can use various pieces of evidence. And again, it's incumbent upon me to know 
when I can ask to use things and when I shouldn't be asking to use things. The one thing that I wanna make clear is that the victim is not a party, but has a role. A victim in a criminal case is a witness. It may be a very important witness, but it is the victim is a witness. As a witness, a victim or a witness can be compelled to attend and um, testify in a case. There's a lot of, there's a difference between can and will be compelled. Um, and that, that is what people from my office, the decisions that people from my office have to make on a daily basis. There's going to, and obviously I'm sure that people have seen things on TV and know about exceptions about, for example, marital privilege and, and the privilege against self-incrimination and all of those types of things. Those are privileges that victims and witnesses may have so to, that would actually keep the Commonwealth from being able to compel them to testify. It is the prosecutor, meaning my job to pursue charges, not a victim's because the crime is against society. A crime may happen against with, with people being like, well, that victim was stabbed. So therefore that crime was against that victim. The crime was actually breaking the law, which is a crime against society. The victim was the person who was hurt by that crime. So in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the decision to charge or not charge and who to call to testify lies with the Commonwealth, meaning someone like myself. And there's kind of a two for a two for um, effect on a victim because the, it's the Commonwealth decision, not a victim's decision. On one hand, a victim may feel uh, a measure of relief because it's not that victim's responsibility to hold an offender accountable. On the other hand, a victim may feel empowered because it's not their decision. Um, they didn't commit the crime against themselves, someone else did, and yet they're not going to get to be the ones that decide if they're going to be, if it's going to be prosecuted or not. So it's, it's definitely a catch-22 situation for victims, but the bottom line is it's not their decision about whether or not a case goes forward or not. It is certainly, and this is a whole other training that I could give, it is certainly something that prosecutors take into account in, in our decision-making process. Um, but ultimately, the way, that the, the, the way that the criminal justice system works is it is the Commonwealth's decision about what gets prosecuted um, to a certain extent. Um, but like I said before, victims do have rights. I did put the site to it in case anyone ever wanted to look it up. It's Massachusetts General Laws and it's called Chapter 258B. And under Massachusetts Laws Chapter 258B, specifically if you're looking at Section 3, there's a whole series of rights, and this is called the Victim Bill of Rights. Honestly, if you just Google Massachusetts Victim Bill of Rights, this is going to come up. You're going to be able to see all of the rights that are afforded victims. I don't necessarily need to go through all of them. I just am more trying to convey that this does exist. It is very comprehensive, and it is something that people from my office, I think from any DA's office, take incredibly seriously. So I'm just gonna give you one small example of how seriously we take this. So in a, in a criminal case, a sentence recommendation would be up to the DA, meaning myself, as opposed to a victim. But we obviously want to talk to the victim about what they want to see happen. And sometimes I'm in complete agreement with a victim about what we think should happen with the case. And sometimes I'm not. But Regardless of whether I'm in agreement or not, my job is to make sure that the judge knows my sentencing recommendation, but my job is also to make sure that the judge knows the victim's sentencing recommendation. So what I do often is judge, this is what I think should happen in this case, and judge, this is what the victim thinks should happen with this case. And I just lay out exactly what the victim has relayed to me to make sure that a judge is aware of what the victim wants. And as you go through the Victim Bill of Rights, it, the victim also has a right to be heard themselves. So if they don't want me to say it, they can be right there and they can say it too. Sometimes they don't wanna to come to court. Sometimes they want me to say it on their behalf. Sometimes even if I know they're gonna say it, I say it too, just to make sure the judge is listening and be like, hey, this is what I want. This is what the victim wants. And the victim wants to tell you themselves what the victim wants. 
So we take these rights very seriously to make sure that even though we know that a victim is not a party, they do have rights. And our job is to ensure that those victims' rights are being adhered to and not trampled on during the criminal justice system. Um, that is the end of that section. The next section is the cases. So a case means that someone has, in, and again, we're talking in the criminal world, a case means that someone is, it starts with someone reporting a crime. Generally, that means someone's reporting a crime to the police. That's generally how a criminal case starts. And they could happen between a 911 call or someone could walk into a police station, someone could flag a police officer down, just any way that it gets reported to the police. There's also the option of, of a civilian can go into, for example, the Concord District Court and apply with one of the clerks for a civilian complaint against someone else in the criminal world. So say something happened and, the vict and a victim felt like there was a crime and the police did not take out a charge, they do have a right to go to a, clerk's, a, a court and to take out what's called a civilian complaint. And then if that civilian complaint gets issued, then the DA's office has to prosecute it. So it doesn't happen very often, but that right is there for them. Assuming it does start with police, then the decisions are made. Is it going to be an arrest? Is it going to be what's called a summons agreement, which means a defendant is given a piece of paper and then told they have to be in court on a certain day and that's when they're charged? Or is there gonna be some sort of investigation that happens before that decision that's made? There's a ton of rules that govern these things. Um, and I, it's just, it's something that needs to get factored in. It's not, every case does not result in an arrest to the day that it happened, in other words. The police are taught and trained to arrest when it's appropriate. The general rule of thumb is if it's a felony, it tends to be an arrest. And if it's a misdemeanor, it tends to not be an arrest. Domestic violence is an anomaly to that because um, there's a bunch of rules that deal with domestic violence cases. And there's certain laws on the books in, Commonwealth, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that say if it's this crime, they shall arrest. So even if it is a misdemeanor, so normally it's a difference of a felony or a misdemeanor, but sometimes there's certain, there's certain, there's certain crimes out there that have their own arrest rules. I did break down common misdemeanors, common felonies. There's not a quiz. You don't need to know all of these, um, but it is just something in terms of there's a lot to know. <laughs> there's a lot to know and, and, and victims aren't required to know these things. The police are required to know these things and the Commonwealth is required to know these things, but victims aren't required to know these things. Um, I did just put an example in here. So there is a crime on the books called domestic violence, assault and battery. This is a relatively new crime in the sense that it's come out uh, in recent years, um, but it basically, makes an additional category of assault and battery that pertains to intimate partners. So if there is a uh, family or household member in this context is defined that for people that are or were married to each other, have a child in common or have or are in a substantive dating relationship. And if, if two people are involved in one of those factors and there is an assault and battery, the crime then becomes a domestic violence assault and battery. It just designates it differently. There's a lot of things that are going on now with tracking statistics about domestic violence. And this is one of the things in terms of charging it this way that's able to let people do a lot of those statistics. Um, I'm just gonna give you one example of how complicated um, charging decisions uh, can be made or ca can be. So if someone, and I'm going to use an example of, um, we'll just use the husband and wife example because that's what we've been talking about. Say the husband puts his hands around his wife's throat and squeezes. Technically, that could be one of three charges. It could be an assault and battery, although in my example, it's a husband and wife, so that would be a domestic violence assault and battery. It could be the crime of strangulation, or it could be the crime of attempted murder. And it's training on behalf of the police and the prosecution to make a determination as to which one of those crimes would be the most appropriate crime. And it's training in those areas of the intent of the defendant, the physical effects on the victim, that there's this weighing balance of, is it going to be an A and B or is it going to be bumped up to the level of strangulation or is it gonna be bumped up even higher to the level of attempted murder? So it's just, it's just one example of how confusing, quite frankly, 
and complicated the criminal justice system can be where one act could technically be any one of three crimes depending on that act. The next section that I wanted to talk about is I wanted to take you quickly through what's called an anatomy of a criminal case in the courts. And if it's in the district court, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background and this is very anecdotal, um, so don't quote me on this. But in my experience, anecdotal experience, I would say 80% of the cases go in the district court and the top 20% of the most serious cases go in the superior court. The way that someone gets their case in Superior Court is that they are either charged with something that has to go to Superior Court, like rape, robbery, murder, trafficking drugs, arm, you know, that type of thing, or there's something that they're charged with, but they have done enough things wrong in the past that kind of graduates them from District Court and causes them to go to the Superior Court. So if someone is charged in the district court, the case either is an arrest and gets brought in or it's an investigation and then it's a, a summons arraignment and the case just remains in district court. All cases start in district court. Even if it's a homicide case, it's going to get arraigned in the district court. If the case is going to remain in the district court, so in other words, it's not a homicide case, it's a case that can remain in the district court, one of those 80% of the cases, it's just gonna remain in the district court where it already was charged. After an investigation, there may be charges that are added or taken away, but it just kind of stays in the court that it was already started in. If it's gonna be in superior court, in order to get to superior court from the district court, there needs to be a grand jury proceeding. This is a secret proceeding. It is, people aren't allowed to, for example, be telling people that they got summoned into grand jury. We don't tell when we summons people into grand jury because it's a secret proceeding. There is not defense attorneys or judges there because it is a proceeding that is where the Commonwealth is presenting their evidence to a grand jury and the grand jury is deciding if the Commonwealth has enough evidence, but the proceedings are recorded and the defendant and his attorney get a copy of that transcript so they know exactly who testified and what they said. The grand jury decides if we are charging the right defendant with the right crime. That's in essence what the defendant does. I mean, sorry, what the grand jury does is to make sure that the right defendant is charged with the right crime. If the grand jury says yes, then the case, like I used the term before, graduates from district court to superior court, and it moves up to be in superior court, and the district court portion of that case will get dismissed. In both courts, after someone is officially charged in that court, the next series of dates that's going to happen for that case are going to be what are called paper dates what I call paper dates. I don't think they're officially called paper dates. I'm sure they're having a very official terms for these things, but I call them paper dates because it's basically one side or the other is filing paperwork to get something from the other side. So one of the things that I have to do as a prosecutor is turn over all of the evidence that I have in my case, all of the witness statements, all of the photographs, if there's a 911 call, if there's medical records, all of that stuff, I have to give the defense copies of and that's what this next series of dates is, is to make sure that the defense has everything that I have that's evidence in my case so that they can look at all the evidence and decide appropriately what they want to do. If they want to get try to get more evidence, if they want to say we don't have enough evidence. So that's what the series of paper dates do is trying to be able to turn over everything that's in our case into what's in to give to the defense attorney. There can also be if they try to say that the police shouldn't have done something or the we don't have enough evidence or they want something suppressed or dismissed or they want they want to file motions to get medical records or they want to try to file motions to get mental health records or they want to get surveillance footage that we didn't get or just so that's why I call them paper dates is because it's just a series of things where either side tries to either give or get more evidence. Then there is a possible resolution. In a criminal case, the only disposition short of trial would be what's called a change of plea, where a defendant chooses to plead guilty in some fashion. It doesn't have to end up being a guilty on his record, but chooses to resolve the case short of a trial. And like I told you before, that's gonna enable the victim to have a right to be heard and to make an impact statement um, and let the judge know what they think should happen to the case. If a defendant decides not to resolve the case short of trial, then the trial will go, to, then the case will go to trial. If it's a victim case, in the majority of victim cases, the victim will have to testify. 
Um, other witnesses would have to testify, other evidence would be presented, and the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. I actually thought about pulling out the reasonable doubt jury instruction and reading it to you all, but I did not want to scare you because I didn't want you to think that the criminal justice system was so biased because I every, I, I mean, I've heard that instruction thousands of times. Every time I hear it, I'm like, oh my God, that is I can't believe anyone has ever convicted of a crime because the standard is so high, but that's the way that it should be. We are presumably taking away someone's liberty because we have proven in a courtroom that they've done something beyond a reasonable doubt. So it is a very, very high standard. And the trial is all about trying to make sure that that standard is adhered to. The burden is on the Commonwealth, meaning someone like myself. We have to present evidence and we have to call witnesses in our case. So we can't be like, oh, I think the defense is gonna call that witness. I'm gonna wait until that witness testifies and use that testimony. We don't get to do that because when, and, you'll, and I'll, I'll talk about this. So the Commonwealth puts on their case and then I can go to the next slide and I'll come back. Oops, I guess I took it out. The Commonwealth puts on their case and then the judge decides whether or not the Commonwealth on its own, without even any other defense um, evidence, has enough evidence to go forward. And assuming it does, then the defense is allowed to call witnesses if they want, but they don't have to. So the burden is always on the Commonwealth. This becomes tricky, and I know this is one of the questions that was asked in the uh, original questions is, what if a victim doesn't want to testify? Or what if the witnesses don't want to testify? Well, one of the trickiest things that we do is make decisions about who we're going to make testify and who we're not. One of the things that factors into that equation is, can we prove the case without the victim? And the different things that we do, and this is what I talked about before, the majority of the rules that pertain to me or the Commonwealth are about when, how, and what we can use for evidence at trial. And there's certain things that we can use and there's certain things that we can't use. There's this, everyone has heard about hearsay. This is hearsay, that's hearsay. I don't know that necessarily everyone knows what hearsay is, but hearsay means that it's a statement that wasn't made in court. That's literally what hearsay. What I'm saying right now, this is hearsay. If, if you were to ever try to sue me about what I said here, this is hearsay because it's not a statement that I'm making in a courtroom. It is an out of court statement. So a lot of the rules that we look at are, can we use these out of court statements? One of the main things that we use in domestic violence prosecutions are called spontaneous utterances. And I just put this little slide in here because it's just an example of one of the things that we do to try to prove a case without having to have a victim testify, or if a victim has asserted a privilege and we can't make that person testify. So the example that I gave here is where something just happened and someone is literally exclaiming, my husband lit the house on fire. That you can see from the graphic, she's upset. She's clearly like, oh my God, this just happened. That is going to be something that's probably going to be admissible as a what's called spontaneous utterance. If there's a fire and two weeks after the fire, the victim says something to her friend, oh yeah, two weeks ago, my husband lit the house on fire that's probably not going to be considered a spontaneous utterance because the, a bunch of time has passed. It's not made while the house is on fire and right when she's so excited about what just happened. So like I said, the judge has to make the decision after the Commonwealth's own case, whether or not we have met our burden. If the judge decides we have, then the defense can choose to call witnesses if they want to, but they don't have to because it's not their burden. The burden of proof is always on the Commonwealth. A if a defense chooses to call witnesses, then they get to call what witnesses they want, they get to put what evidence they want in, and the Commonwealth has to cross-examine them. Then the judge has to decide again, now looking at what the Commonwealth did and what the defense did, does the Commonwealth still have enough evidence? Meaning, did the defense introduce some doubt that basically overtook what the Commonwealth had introduced. And the judge can dismiss the case at that point. Assuming the judge says no, then the case goes in front of the jury or the judge if it was a bench trial, and they decide if the defendant is guilty or not. If the defendant is not guilty, then the case is over. 
done. There's nothing, there is no right of the Commonwealth to appeal. It is just done. If the case is, if the defendant is found guilty, then a defendant is found guilty and a judge then uh, would sentence the defendant. This is again, when a victim would have a right to be heard. The Commonwealth makes a recommendation, the victim makes a recommendation, the defense attorney makes a recommendation. The sentencing is completely up to the judge. It is in the sole discretion of the judge what they want to do, unless it involves something involving a statutory minimum mandatory, which in victim cases, especially domestic violence cases, there aren't any minimum mandatories. So the discretion is solely in the hands of the judge. After the conviction, and this is what I mentioned at the very beginning, there's a series of appeals that a defendant could have. They could appeal the whole case, they could appeal certain charges, they could try to appeal the sentence, they can appeal it to the appeals court, they can try to file what's called a motion for new trial to the sentencing judge. They could just, there's a series of events that happen that even when a case is over, it seems to be over, it's really not over. And our office is very intimately involved in all of this post-conviction work um, about probation and motions for new trial and appeals. And we work with victims and make sure that they're aware every step of the way about what's happening with all of these things that occur after a alleged end of a case. Um, Jackie, did you want me to go into, okay, into restraining orders? Yes. Okay. Keep going. So the last section that I have is restraining orders, and I'll try to be pretty brief on this, but the main chapter and section that deals with restraining orders is, again, that Massachusetts general law, and it's chapter 209A, and that is all of the law that governs restraining orders. Um, if it's 208, that deals with probate restraining orders, but there's different kinds of restraining orders. And it basically is an order that restricts another individual <clears throat> from doing from doing something. So either from going somewhere or from contacting someone or from doing something. It can be sought on an emergency basis through a police department. So say something happens you know, at midnight on a Saturday, they're not gonna make you wait to get a restraining order until court opens at 9 a.m. on a Monday. You get to call the police, the police, then there's this whole judicial emergency judicial response where a judge gets called in the middle of the night you basically tell them why you need a restraining order and the judge says yay or nay over the phone at midnight on a Saturday night as opposed to waiting until Monday because they understand that these could be emergency situations where one is needed. Then if one is given, say my Saturday at midnight you know, proposal, that is only good until 9 a.m. Monday morning. And then you have to go in front of the normal judge at 9 a.m. on Monday morning to be there to get your normal restraining order. A restraining order is good for 10 days, normally. I mean, it could be nine, it could be 11, but roughly 10 days. And then there is a hearing, in which case it can be extended for a year or six months or depending on what you ask for, but most people ask for a year. A defendant has a right to oppose it. They have a right to appear for it. And that's why they give that 10 day hearing because normally when a victim is coming in to get a restraining order, the defendant is not there. So that's why they give the restraining order to create a, a level, a measure of safety, but it also gives the defendant the right to be heard on whether or not he should have the restraining order extended against him. So that's the purpose of that kind of very short restraining order and then a much longer restraining order. It is not a criminal case, meaning it is a civil restraining order, but if it is violated, that can be a criminal case. Um, a lot of people ask about custody and support, and it, it can be part of a restraining order, but it generally is part of a probate order. And if there's a difference between what's on a probate order and what's on a restraining order, the probate order trumps. Um, one of the things that I put in here because I get a lot of questions about it is visits. A lot of people, visits can't, well, can be ordered in district court if they are agreed to. They cannot be ordered um, if they are not agreed to. Um, I briefly wanted to just touch base about criminal harassment. So this is a different chapter and section. It's chapter 258E. It is a very, very similar, pro it's actually an identical process to the 209A order, meaning there still is the emergency order. There still is the original like Monday morning order. There's still the 10 day order. There's still the year order. Like all of that process is exactly the same, but you have to show in order to be eligible for a criminal harassment order, there has to be two different things. There's an either or there's an or. One of them is three or more acts 
of willful and malicious conduct aimed at a specific person. So it can't be aimed at an entity. Like you can't just have someone, for example, picketing the Dunkin' Donuts. So it has to be at a specific person committed with the intent to cause fear, intimidation, abuse, or damage to property that does in fact cause fear, intimidation, abuse, or damage to property. That's one way to be eligible for a criminal harassment um, prevention order. The other way to be eligible is that an act by force, threat, or duress causes another to involuntarily engage in sexual relationships, sorry, sexual relations, or constitutes one of the enumerated crimes of indecent assault and battery, AND on a disabled person, rape, assault with intent to rape, stalking, or criminal harassment. Um, so again, these are civil orders, but they can be criminally enforced, just like a restraining order. So both the 258E and the 209A orders can be criminally um, enforced for certain of, of the prohibitions. So if someone is told to stay away from a victim and they don't stay away from a victim, that is going to be a criminal infraction. Um, if someone is told to pay child support and they don't pay child support, that is not going to be a criminal action. So the, there are certain portions of the statute that are arrestable and that are criminal. And there's other certain portions of the statute that pertain to non-safety issues. Um, those are going to be ones that have to be enforced through a probate order or a contempt order. Um, that is the end that I had. I wanted to go to the questions to see if there's anything else. Somebody had asked about the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations depends on the crime that's the crime that is involved. So some of the statutes of limitations, then the general statute of limitations is six years, but there are a number of much, much longer statute of limitations when it comes to, for example, child sexual abuse or that type of thing. There's also stat, the thing, there's things that toll a statute of limitations. So if, if, if a defendant fled his jurisdiction, for example, and they, he knew the police was after him and he fled to say Florida for 15 years, that might toll the um, statute of limitations. So the short answer is I can't tell you a statute of limitations unless I know the exact crime or the circumstances of it, but they do vary um, by case. A general statute of limitations is a minimum of six years though. I'm just trying to could you that. before you rush to the next question, could yep. you uh, could you um, make it clear that the 209A is around a domestic relationship versus a 258E? Yes, a 209A would involve people that um, this is going to be a test if I can remember all of them. It is people <laughs> that either are or were married, or in a substantive dating relationship, engaged, have a child in common, related by blood or marriage, or live in the same household. Yeah. So I believe I got them all, but yeah. it is something pertaining to, there has to be what's called a domestic type relationship. So for example, roommates that would cover it or uh, blood relatives, or um, like they say, a substantive dating relationship. I get a lot of questions about what a substantive dating relationship is. I especially get a lot of questions about what a substantive, substantive dating relationship is in the, with the advent of online dating. Um, that is going to be something that judges have to weigh, and some judges take different positions about it. Some judges are, you have to have a minimum of five dates, and if you've gone on five dates, you're in a substantive dating relationship. Other judges are like, you have one really good date, and all of a sudden you're in a substantive dating relationship. So it's really going to depend um, on, uh, uh, ultimately, it's going to be up to a judge to decide if there is a a substantive dating relationship. And the 258E, they're not domestically related. Correct. It has to be one or the other of those two prongs of either the three act prong or a sex crime or one of the other enumerated crimes. One of the questions that did come up was, um, can an abuser be monitored in order to catch them in the act and not have the victim testify? The short answer to that is no. And yes, <laughs> um, but the short answer to that is no. Um, there isn't any provision out there that, that puts a monitoring in place to keep a victim from having to testify. However, if a defendant, and I'm just gonna give you an example, say a defendant is being monitored because say he's out on pretrial conditions of release. And one of those conditions of release is he has to wear a GPS bracelet. And the victim wants to report that he came to her house. 
but doesn't necessarily want to have to testify to that. I would be able to potentially get those GPS records from his monitor to show that he went to the victim's house and violated a restraining order, and I might not necessarily need the victim to testify to that. So the monitoring isn't put into place to help a victim not have to testify, but there are certain monitorings that can be put into place that we might be able to use to keep a victim from having to testify. I'm gonna to jump to the most recent question. Um, please discuss plea bargaining and the controversial aspects. Is it common as alleged by some that poor defendants are sometimes often intimidated pleading guilty to a lesser charge to avoid a threat of being convicted for a more serious charge despite being innocent? Well, that is a, that is a topic I could talk about for an hour, um, but I will try not to. <laughs> um, I think the short answer to that is and this is an anecdotal answer. I think things are much different these days than they used to be when I started 23 years ago. I think that it is part, I obviously don't get to talk to the defendants myself. So I don't get to be a part of that conversation with them to make sure that they understand all their rights. That's what their attorney's job is. But I can tell you that what I do now is part of my job, what I feel is part of my job is to also make sure that a defense attorney does their job. So if I have, first of all, I'm not prosecuting a case that I do not believe a defendant is guilty in. It's just that 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 may happen on TV. I see law and order where they go arrest this person and they're like, oh, we got the wrong person. Let's go arrest this person. That is TV. <laughs> that does not happen. Um, mm -hmm. So it is we're not prosecuting people that we do not believe are guilty. The, I will make sure, at least I do my best to make sure that it is explained to everyone that it needs to be explained to that these are the options. Um, I have, I've had meetings with defense attorneys and victims so that I'm explaining it to the defense attorney in front of the victim. So the victim is assured that I'm saying exactly to the defense attorney what I have said to the victim. Hmm. I've invited a defendant's family to come in and meet with me and explain the options to them because they didn't believe a defense attorney when the defense attorney presented the options to them. So I am I, I, I'm not allowed to talk to a defendant because of the rules of the court. So I can't explain it to a defendant. But the attorneys that I know, their whole role is to be a zealous advocate for their client and explain the options to them. In terms of the disparity of, of, of money, um, I don't see that as being the issue now that I might have seen that be the issue 20 years ago. Um, lawyers are better, prosecutors are better, the system is a little bit more fair, um, and it is our job to make sure that someone's not treated differently because they have money. Um, can someone report abuse on behalf of someone else who is too afraid to come forward? Absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, a victim, a, a victim's friend, sister, family, neighbor. We get that all the time where a neighbor calls 911 about something that's going on um, at the house next door and the victim didn't report it. We may not be able to prosecute it if we can't get enough evidence to go forward without a victim, but we could certainly get involved and try to create a safer situation for that victim, even if the victim chooses not to participate with us. And it's always better for, uh, better for us to be aware of it because if, I'll just give you an example. If a, if a friend is concerned for their, for their friend and they want to report it to the police and then they report it to the police and say the, the defendant has been threatening the victim with a gun and there's this terrible history and that my victim, my friend is not safe. Say the victim does call 911 two weeks later, the officers are going to have the benefit of knowing that background when they respond mm -hmm. that they wouldn't have known if that friend hadn't notified us. If the police are called to a house because of a violent incident with someone with a mental health condition, can the family request that individual go to a mental health court? There is a mental health court. It isn't something that happens after an arrest. It, it, we do have certain mental health courts um, in district court and it's, it's more of a probationary period. So there isn't a mental health like court to charge someone. If someone has mental health issues, the way that it gets addressed is it can be, uh, first of all, if there's significant mental health issues that would impair a defendant's competency or criminal responsibility, the defendant would be evaluated for that. And if he was not competent or criminal responsible, he wouldn't be prosecuted in a criminal court. 
A second alternative is if a defendant has mental health deficiencies that don't rise the level of criminal responsibility or competency, they can be evaluated for a mental health plan. And in some of the, in the district court, at least, there is a mental health court. It's almost like a drug court or a gun court, which other people might be more familiar with, where its sole purpose is to facilitate better monitoring of people that have mental health issues. I think this might be the last question, although we're, you know, if someone has anything more, we're willing to answer that. Um, what are the long lasting impacts from COVID or changes on both the courts and the restraining order process? Hmm. Um, well, I anecdotally saw COVID take a lot of factors that's involved in domestic violence, namely the isolation that, that, that assists batterers in being able to have domestic violence against their partner. And COVID made that much easier for them to isolate their partners because they didn't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't go talk to their parents and they couldn't go talk to their friends. They couldn't go to the doctor. They couldn't even go to the grocery store. They couldn't go anywhere. And so, and potentially both parties were home. So I, I saw COVID have a very real chilling effect on the reporting of domestic violence and the ability to isolate someone and put them into a domestic violence situation. There are good things and bad things that have come in my, again, this is all anecdotal, but good things and bad things that I have seen come from COVID in terms of domestic violence cases. One of which is that victims have been, have been given the opportunity of zooming into court as opposed to having to, for example, take the day off work and go to court. The flip side of that is victims and defendants have been given the opportunity to zoom into court as opposed to have to go into court. So it's a good and it's a bad. And the good mm -hmm. is they don't have to take a day off work. The bad is they might be zooming in the same household that their abuser is. Right. And they don't get to be very candid because the person there's somebody, you guys see this little square in my den. You have no idea who's six feet over there potentially mm -hmm. sitting in a chair staring at me while I'm talking to you. So it was, it was a good thing in that it opened doors and allowed people access, but it's a bad thing because we don't know what's going on behind those closed doors. And sometimes just getting out of the house to be able to go to court to get a restraining order was a safer scenario than doing it on Zoom. So I can see both good and bad. Mm -hmm. What I have gotten a lot of questions are, is COVID going to make it so victims don't have to come in and testify in court? Mm -hmm. and they could do it uh, remotely. And the answer to that is, I have not been told the answer to that, but I can guarantee you the answer to that is no. Okay. <laughs> it's not going to change that requirement. <laughs> well, on the topic of victims, we have one last question. It may be hard for you to answer, but it's something to consider. Why aren't there better victims' rights laws in the Commonwealth? For instance, other people who heard the victim share about the abuse or saw the victim abuse and could report the matter to law enforcement, court system, et cetera. Are we asking too much of the victim in this process? The answer to that is yes, we are asking too much of victims in this process. And the other answer to that is why is that? It's because, uh, mm -hmm. well, I could give you a very funny answer. It's because I don't run the system. <laughs> but <laughs> right. but the, 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 the better answer is because, and this is the more appropriate answer, we have to weigh a victim's rights with a defendant's rights. And a defendant, the defendant has the right to face their accuser. And that is the primary right that most of these other rules that I have talked about have stemmed from, is it comes from a right of a defendant. We are in the process of carving out more victims' rights. I have a number of ideas for more carve-outs for victims' rights. There's, for example, there's in Massachusetts, there is a, a, a ability to have what's called a first complaint witness, where if someone is sexually assaulted, the very first person that they tell of that sexual assault gets to come in and testify to that. In other states, they have that exception for domestic violence. In Massachusetts, we don't. Mm. I would love for there to be that exception. This is the little soapbox that I get on anytime I have a platform because I would love there to be this exception in Massachusetts, and I, it's, it's something that needs to get born of by case law um, or by a statute. And that is the legislature that needs to create this type of statute. So to answer the question is, 
yes, I think we do ask too much of victims. I understand where it comes from because it comes from defendants' rights. It's not this arbitrary, we're just going to be mean to victims. It comes from an okay place. It just is a very hard system on a victim mm -hmm. when they've already been victimized. And then we have all of these stringent requirements for what we can and can't do, which may come from a good place. But I do think there needs to be, if we can show that something is reasonable and reliable, then I think there should be able to be an exception to allow someone else to be able to come in and testify to that. Mm -hmm. And is anyone that you know of working on making this a statute or legislation? Um, I've suggested it to any number of people, so we'll see. <laughs> All right, but there's hope. There's hope. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. And I, again, am thrilled. We often have Suzanne come and, and educate our advocates. Uh, she's trained our police. I mean, there's any number of ways in which we've worked together through the years. And every time you hit it out of the park. So I want to say thank you very much for being with us tonight. I also want to give a big shout out to uh, Jessica and Alex in the back office, so to speak. I want to thank everyone who was able to join us tonight and for hanging in with us because Suzanne is worth it. And thank you very much, Suzanne, for being with us. We really appreciate it.